this morning we're visiting a very familiar passage of Scripture. So turn with me to Romans 1, verses 7 to 18. And I'm not ashamed of the Gospel is the title that we're considering this morning. And last time we looked at this passage of Scripture, we go way back to 2006. And uh, you probably remember our study back then, and the reality of what God was saying to us. And I believe God is saying a very similar thing in this year, 2018. So let's turn to God's Word and read God's Word together. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit, is preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen. And praise God for his work. The reality is... In this world, we are told that the gospel means nothing anymore. For many folks, we should be ashamed of the gospel. Because it is something that is not in line with society's views and principles. We're told that our message, the message of the gospel, is inappropriate. It shouldn't be heard in the public place. And we'll be tight anyone who preaches good news on the general high street. They're likely to be arrested for offending other people around them. But yet when you begin to look at this passage of scripture, in 58 AD, on a spring morning, a man of small statures on a key sign of the Corinthian port of Lechium. And he's part of a crowd saying farewell to a middle-aged woman. That woman was Phoebe, one of the deaconesses at the church in St. Crea. And this valued woman of God was entrusted, which seemed on the surface to be a menial task. But this menial task was one of great importance. And Romans 16 and verses 1 and 2 reminds us her task was to take Paul's letter to the Roman church. Or far across the sea, she would go. And she would deliver it into the hands of the leaders of the church in Rome. And some have indicated in their writings that she was nothing but a messenger girl. But others would say it was a message girl who changed the face of the Christian church. You see, Phoebe was not unlike Paul. She was not in any way, shape or form ashamed of the gospel. Back in those days, your life was at risk if you bore the name of Christ, if you were a Christian. People were out to get you. The gospel was not for the faint-hearted. And yet this woman is prepared to lay her life on the line, to carry a letter which would be seen to be something of seditious nature to the church in Rome. 
And she was so faithful to God. She was so in tune with the Lord that she was prepared even to risk her life and the shame of public trial to obey the call of God in doing what God asked her to do. And perhaps the question that we need to ask ourselves in 2018 is, are we ashamed of what we believe? Are we ashamed of the gospel? Do you just keep quiet and not mention it for fear of offending anyone? For fear of upsetting anyone? The reality is, when we are called of God, when we are called of, according to his purpose, we are called to accept the reality of a mission-orientated life. Go ye into all the world and proclaim good news. Jesus commanded his disciples. And that means you and I if we bear the name of Christ. It's 19 years ago we were publicly set apart by the church here to preach and teach and pastorally serve and care. It's 30 years come June that we were ordained into the, and inducted into the ministry of the gospel at South Leith Baptist Church. And I can recall the questions that were asked on the vacancy committee at that time in South Leith. And also can recall some of the questions that some of you folks asked of us all those years ago in Inverkeering when we met at a church meeting down in the Haven. What are you going to do for the youth? What are you going to do about evangelism? How are you going to evangelize? Will you visit the elderly and the sick? What do you believe regarding preaching? How many hours a week are you going to work? And so the questions came thick and fast. And I realized back 30 years ago, and then was reminded of it 19 years ago when we came here, that no one's up to the task. No one is up to the task of serving the Lord. But the reality is, as you look at verse 16 this morning, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That applies not just to folks who wear a white collar round their neck or wear fancy robe or are set apart and called to preach and teach and so on. That's just part of it. We each have a calling in the Lord. We each have a responsibility in the Lord. And we're in the task together. Just as Phoebe's called to take the task, the letter, over to Rome. Join with the leaders in Rome to, to consider it. It's a joint task. And we, along with the worldwide church of Christ, today are in the task of not being ashamed of the gospel and taking the gospel to the nations. I wonder how we view this passage of scripture this morning. I remember vividly, I've got a picture in my mind even as I speak right now, of driving home to Edinburgh that evening having left the haven and the folks behind. And this passage of scripture coming back to me time after time after time after time in the days that preceded that meeting. And I realise afresh at the threshold of 2018, once more, the gospel is about being together in Christ and doing the things of Christ together and fulfilling our calling in Christ together as a fellowship. It is not a one-man band game or a one-woman band game. It is a team effort together in the gospel, together in Christ. Because together we stand, divided we fall. And if we are in a frame of mind, that's the world's frame of mind. 
that we come along to take rather than partake of the things of Christ as we come to worship. Then we miss out on the reality. Church becomes no more than a theatre with the performer on the platform entertaining us or otherwise. Together in the gospel, we fulfill our calling as we use our gifts together in Christ, as we share together in Christ, each according to our own calling, called according to God's purpose. Together we follow the gospel where God has placed us to be. You see, Paul was writing to a vibrant, growing church. A church that he didn't found, but had a heart for. A church that had its own growing pains and also required deep godly wisdom and counsel and handling all the different views of the world around them and the folks in the church. But nevertheless, the church in Rome was called according to God's purpose, called of Christ to serve him, to be a light to the world. And they were making an impact on Rome, the heart of the Roman Empire. The biggest empire the world had ever seen. They were the ones who brought peace to a world in turmoil and conflict. They were the ones who pleased the world. They were the ones who ensured safe travel. They were the ones who ensured safe governance. They were a powerful, powerful nation. And at the heart of their nation, here is a church that's not ashamed of the gospel, prepared to proclaim the gospel, and their church was growing. And the gospel is God's power for salvation. They fully, 100% believe that. Let's never ever forget the impact the gospel made on the lives of individuals way back in the beginning. It was difficult times. It was hard times. The opposition was there. And yet, as folks came to faith in Christ, they shared that faith and salvation visited those with whom they shared. And in the call to minister to a hurting world, it's no different in 2018. Our call to a hurting world to share the message of the gospel. Well, back in Rome, no one was equal to the task. Back in Inverkeering and in Syria, no one is equal to the task. But if we're called according to God's purpose, the privilege of leading others to faith is our calling, our residential, our basic task. And as we share the word of God, despite all the opposition, Despite all the fear and the dangers, the reality is the gospel changes lives. But it can only change lives if it's heard and God's people rise to the task. You know, in the call to ministry, I realized very quickly that no one's equal to the task of leading others to faith and growth in Christ. Saved but by the grace of God and the power of God. You know, some folks have the privilege of leading many to faith. Others, perhaps, lead only a few to faith in their lifetime. But nevertheless, the preaching of the word of God has to continue. <coughs> and we need, by faith, to believe that in the preaching of God's good news, that gospel... A harvest of souls will return into the kingdom of God. A harvest returning, pressed down, shaken together, and flowing over. And as it's written in 1 Corinthians in 3 and verse 6, the reality is, I planted a polished water, but God made it grow. It's a team effort in the kingdom of God. 
And over the years, it's been a team effort. And by the grace of God, we've seen the hand of God at work in this place and in this fellowship. And it continues on as we stand together in Christ, supporting one another, caring for one another, and ministering the gospel to a needy world. When we came to IBC all those years ago, we said we'd build on what had gone before. And we've sought to do that. Building on the ministries before us. How successfully that is, well that's for others to say some other time. But when Paul talks of the power of God, he's using this wonderful word called Junimus. And of course, we get a nice wonderful word, and maybe it's politically incorrect to put that on the screen. We get our word dynamite from it. Good. And the reality is, we know what dynamite does. Light a fuse, and exactly, Michael, it goes boom. If you want to remove a huge, massive lump of rock, put your explosive in, light the fuse, and make sure you're far enough away from it. And it moves. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that the gospel can move the immovable. Do we honestly believe that? No. If we say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, do we believe that the gospel can move the immovable? Sometimes within church life, we get so caught up in routine and schedules that we fail to remind ourselves of the boom that moves the immovable. By faith, the energy of God, the power of God at work can move mountains. I wonder if we really believe that this morning. Do we believe the power of God can move mountains? Well, if you want to kind of move on in the picture of dynamic energy, you know, the stick of dynamite that can blow away a rock that's been there since time memorial, you get your word dynamo from the same particular word. And that picture of the dynamo, the constant movement, that then creates power. Some of you folks will remember you know, your three speed Sturmy Archer gearing system on your bike. And if you had a bit of money, you actually had the little dynamo on the back. And if you were really posh, it was built into the hub of the wheel. And you were cycling along the road. And if you were really clever, you put a bigger bulb in your headlight. And it was like a searchlight coming along the road that blinded all the car users. I'll not tell you why I did. But the minute you stopped, so did the light. And from a bright shining light that illuminated everything, the minute that you stopped, blackness. You know, it's a little bit like that in the Gospels. The minute this church stops preaching the Gospel, becomes ashamed of the Gospel, if you like, darkness takes over. And perhaps the reality is in our nation today, the condition of our nation is as a result of the church being ashamed of the gospel. And whenever the church becomes ashamed of the gospel, and by the church I mean individuals as well as corporately, the darkness comes in like a flood. And takes over. And so while the church can point the finger at the world around us and say, this is wrong, that's wrong, the next thing's wrong, the reality is, if the church 
had continued to be the light in our nation and had not become ashamed of the gospel, then our nation would not be in the condition it's in today. We have to take our responsibility. And it's as God's people become God's people once more. And declare that they're not ashamed of this powerful message of salvation. Then the world will change. And the darkness will be banished once more from our nation. Because God has the victory. And God's word is the last word. Not the world's word. I'm not ashamed of this powerful message of salvation, Paul says. Because I know for all who believe will find true meaning in life and salvation through Christ. Uh -oh. And that is a reality for us this morning. What about Matthew chapter 8 and verse 25? The disciples went and woke Jesus from sleep, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. Well, the gospel is salvation from danger. If we trust in Christ, God sees us through all the circumstances of God. And the disciples found that firsthand. In the boat, everything is coming against them. Battle hardened sailors, stormed in life. They had been through it all before. They were in fear for their life. They were the experienced ones. They were the ones who knew everything. And yet their lives were threatened. What did they do? They came to Christ. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And that message of salvation is the same today. And perhaps we feel like we're drowning in the world. Drowning in the sea of political correctness and everything else. And we think that we're drowning. Well, there's only one place for us to go. And there's only one thing for us to do is not to be ashamed of the gospel and cast ourselves on the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. In World War I, Robert Rupert Rook said, Safe shall be my going, secretly armed against all death's endeavours, safe through all, safe when lost, safe where men fall, and if these poor limbs die, I will be in the place where e'er I am safest. The Lord safe in the arms of Jesus. And of course, salvation comes as well from life's infections of influence. And we see that in almost every single day, another influence comes along the way. And the whispering word of Satan is in our ears and in our minds. Acts 2 and 40 reminds us save yourselves from this corrupt generation. In other words, the corruption of this world brings forth life's infections. And the root cause of all life's infections are sin. And the only way to solve that infection is to cast ourselves upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And proclaim his good news that we can be saved from our sins. And it's also salvation from being lost. The Son of Man came to save that which was lost. Remember Luke chapter 19 and verse 10? Most folks think, I'm okay. Most folks think, life is good and I can get on with life. And I don't need God, I don't need anything else. Just go away, leave me alone, I'm okay. And they don't realize their loss. Until they find themselves in darkness. With nowhere to turn. And there's only one way to turn in that darkness. There's only one way to find a way out of being lost. And that is to have light. And the light of the gospel has to come forth. And when the light of the gospel shines into a person's life. There is an absolute disarray. Suddenly they see a way forward. Because they see life and all the proclamations of this world for what it is, 
nothing compared to the gospel of Christ. In Matthew 1 and 21, and we've been reading that over quite a number of times over these last few weeks, it reminds us that she will give birth to her son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Save in the arms of Jesus. Save from sin's power and condemnation. No more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what the gospel proclaims. If we turn, repent and believe. No longer are we ensnared by sin's chains. No longer are we dragged down. We are lifted up and the chains fall off and we're set free. And it's salvation from the wrath of God as well. That's the message of the gospel. Good news. Good news to tell people, look, you are not going to die. You can live forever. Wow. What a message. Tell me more. You know, how much is spent on the products of this world to stop the aging process? How much money is spent on all the creams and the potions to stop aging? I mean, you can see from my skin, you know, how much potions I've got on. It's like a face that launched a thousand ships. It's all battered. At the end of the day, we can fight everything in life and try and fight all the aging symptoms, but one day we're going to die. You could live till a hundred, but you're still going to die. But if you're looking for an everlasting life, it's not in the creams and the potions and all the products of this world, it can only be found in the gospel. And why be ashamed of a message that's going to offer everlasting life for those who believe? I could feel an advertising campaign come on there. And you know what? The reality is, the church's advertising campaign, if you like, has grown to a halt. Because very often within the church at large in our nation, we're not heard anymore. We're not seen anymore. We're too busy hiding in our church buildings and ignoring or blending in so much so that we're no different and we've become ashamed of the gospel. I can declare right now this morning, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation. And with my dying breath, I will proclaim that. And that is how the church began and grew. And the world was turned upside down. It was salvation which points to the last days. If you look at the scriptures, Romans 13 and 11. And to do this, understanding the present time, the house has come for you to waken up from sleep. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Our salvation comes to fruition, of course, when the Lord calls us home or comes again. But until then, we need to proclaim God's good news. So when the last days do come, we are not to be found in the dark or wanting. Like many will be, unless the church wakens up and proclaims the gospel afresh. You know, sometimes say, folks say, well, that's the preacher's task. That's what we pay him for. Let him get on with it. We employ him to do the task. But let me tell you, it is not. It is not the preacher's task. 
It is the church's task to proclaim the good news of Christ. To preach Christ and Him crucified. We preach together as a team. We preach together as one. We serve together as one. Love together as one. Care together as one. And as one, we make a message given out to the world that we're not ashamed of the gospel and we proclaim that gospel and as we do so the light begins to push away the darkness and banish the darkness. And such is the power of the gospel to save. 1 Corinthians 1 and 23 we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Well, how many times have we come across that? In other words, the message is offensive to the religious folks. And that's part of the big problem that we have today. That for folks who are, quote, religious, members of the church, but perhaps their hearts are strangely cold towards the things of Christ. The gospel message becomes offensive to them. The truth of God's word becomes offensive. And when it becomes an offensive, then you just don't see anything. And then you're welcoming the darkness to come in, rather than proclaiming the light that banishes the darkness and casts away the lies of the evil one. But you know, for the intellectuals in the world, well, it's foolishness. It's a lot of rubbish. Logically, it is not anything that I want anything to do with, some would say. I thought it through. Well, who is the fool on the day when Christ returns or we are called home to stand before his judgment throne? Who will be the fool on that day? Who will dare say their knees will not tremble before an awesome judging God? Who will judge with fairness and justice? People need to hear the message of the gospel. Even if they think it's foolishness, they must hear the hope that's the gospel. And you know the amazing thing is that folks who have spent a whole life rejecting the gospel have found the reality of God's word change their lives. And suddenly from saying, I have examined all this intellectually, I am the most clever of people, I found faith in Christ. And suddenly I realized how wrong I could be. 2 Timothy 4 and 2 says, Preach the word and be prepared in and out of season to correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Discipline, guidance, encouragement, all part of the responsibility of the church. Together corporately. And Ephesians 4 and 11 reminds us that some are called to be pastors and teachers, others have different gifts. We all work together in the gospel. And the passage goes on in verse 12 in that Ephesians passage to prepare God's people for what? Works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. In other words, we do the things that God wants us to do and reach out into the world. The role of nurturing, building up, leading the flock of Christ to maturity. Together we grow. Together in Christ we stand. Divided we fall. As one old minister at the end of his life said, as a believer, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because if Christ can give up his life for me when he asked me to give up my life in service for him, why should I be ashamed of such a a message of love. Well, what's our calling and task this morning? What is our calling and task in Christ this morning? 
Well, our calling in Christ is not to be ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God unto salvation. And this morning, I'm going to halt off at that point. Because I want us to consider and reflect and move over some of the things I've been saying. And I can't tell you how much I've wrestled with this word this morning. There's even more to say, but I can remain for another time. And I don't know why God wants us to hear what we're hearing this morning. But I honestly believe 100% this is God's work for us as a venture. What are we going to do with regard to the future and the purposes of God in this era? At this point in time, we really need to cast ourselves upon the Lord and pray. And for us together to seek the mind of Christ. And then to rise from our knees and do the mind of Christ. Because this generation is dying. And dying very, very quickly. I wonder if we realise this morning the age dynamics of this area. A huge number of older folks are lost and need to know the message and the love of Christ. A huge number of younger folks coming into the town as some of the older folks are passing away. They come in and take over a family house, suddenly it's a different direction. They are lost. The church has to be the church. And it begins by declaring to the world we're not ashamed of the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, in your mercy, we cry out to you and pray that you would help us to understand the truths of your word. Help us to understand that we follow. Help us to know the mind of Christ. Help us to seek the mind of Christ. Help us to be more sensitive to the prompting and leading of your spirit. And Father God, in your mercy, we cry out to you that you would bring forth a harvest from the ministries of this place. Bring forth a harvest of souls. Let the folks, Father God, who come along to the various things that we have in this place, find true salvation in Christ. And Father God, build your church so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we cast ourselves upon you, crying out to you, Lord, let your will be done here in our lives and in this church as it would be done in heaven for Jesus' sake. Father, in your mercy, hear the cry of our heart this morning. Hear the cry of our heart. In Jesus' name. Amen.